Are you guys ready for our guest of the night? Bring him on. Hello there. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Howdy. <laughs> okay, so just so you know, um, here on the on the call, we got Travis here who's on a phone. So that little buzzy here is because he's on his phone. Hey. We got James here who's my co-host. Hi. Say hi, James. And then I'm Jeremiah who I've been doing most of the contacting and I'm in charge. So. He's the dude. <laughs> All right. I'm in charge. Okay, so do you want us to refer to you as Kevin or Mr. Anderson or – Now, Kevin is fine, please. Mr. Anderson is either the dad's name or the guy from the Matrix. Yeah, I was just going <laughs> to say, hello, Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson, welcome back. <laughs> we have Hugo God, Weaving here. All I'm saying is thank God we don't have Hugo Weaving on this episode too or else it'll get real weird real quick. Uh, I, yes, well, but let's not go there. Let's not go there. Yeah, it's not good. Either. Okay, so I guess the, we're going to start off with, um, with a bang. Um, we've had lots of uh, other authors on the show. We've had um, Barbara Hamley, Steve Perry, um, Dave Wolverton, and others. And one unique th um, thread between all of them is that they all say that you are responsible for getting them into Star Wars writing, and you were the one responsible for basically um, shepherding um, Star Wars creative content back in the day. So how did that even start, and how did you become the unofficial – so to speak, um, content creator or content editor for uh, Star Wars novels. Well, I'm glad to hear them say that. It shows you just how far five bucks will go when you give it to somebody. But um, <laughs> let's see. So I was about the second or third person that got asked to do the, the new extended universe stuff. I mean, Tim Zahn was obviously the first one writing the you know, the Empire, uh, the Thrawn trilogy, um, and then. Let's see if I get this right. Kathy Tires was the next one who did the Truce of Akura right immediately, set right immediately after Return of the Jedi. Uh, and then I got asked to do the Jedi Academy trilogy. But they didn't, Lucasfilm didn't tell me what to do. They just said, you want to write a Star Wars trilogy. So I wanted to follow after Tim Zahn's trilogy because I had read the first two and he sent me the manuscript of The Last Command when he was working on it. I just felt that it seemed better to have it all fit together in a, a real timeline. Now, at the time, the two big things going on were Star Trek books and Star Wars books. And Star Trek books have a completely different philosophy. They had it so that every single Star Trek book was independent, that you could pick up any one of them and read it and it didn't have any connection to any other thing. But Star Wars wasn't designed to be episodic. It was a big epic that had characters changing over the course of the three movies and and giant wars and, and things that mattered and they kept going. You couldn't just have it end the same as it was when it began. Now that's that's kind of a long way of saying that I wanted my books to fit in with the other ones that were being written. And while I was starting to plot my Jedi Academy books, and I was reading and, and in contact with Tim, then I discovered that there was this thing called Dark Empire, a, a big comic series that Tom Beach and Cam Kennedy did for Dark Horse. Now, Dark Empire was done pretty much independently of Tim Zahn's books. They were both um, they were both done at the same time. That's hard to imagine right now, but you have to remember at that time. There was nothing with Star Wars. There were no other films. There had been no books. For common wisdom in publishing was that Star Wars was, was as dead as voice to the bottom of the sea. So it didn't really matter very much that they were doing comics on the one hand and, and novels on the other. So when I talked to Lucasfilm and said, well, wait a minute, there's this Dark Empire series that has a bunch of different things in it than Tim Zahn's Thrawn trilogy does, um, they said, oh, don't worry about it. You don't just have to refer to the events in Dark Empire. But if I read, when I read Dark Empire, Leia has another baby, Luke goes over to the dark side, and the Emperor comes back to life. Not really the sort of stuff that you can just, like, forget and ignore and pretend that it didn't happen. So I did my best to make my Jedi Academy books bring 
Tim's storyline and Tom Beach's storyline into alignment so that, that they all happen in the same universe. And as I was working on that, um, Dave Wolverton was asked to write The Courtship of Princess Leia, so he started having um, his plotting sessions, and he wanted to drop in a few things that led up to my books. Um, Tim Zahn, before he finished writing The Last Command, he inserted a few things to introduce a couple of my characters. So it was kind of a fun uh, game that we were starting to do that all of our stories had to connect. It's much more prevalent later, of course, when I did the Tales from the Mos Eisley Cantina and Tales from Java's Palace. Those were a whole bunch of short stories, and all of them interconnected, and everybody had to be in touch with everybody else so that their stories didn't contradict. And then when Mike Stackhall was doing the X-Wing books and, and I Jedi, of course, I Jedi, that whole story dances around the story of my Jedi Academy books, so I've I made room for him to tell his story. It was all one big happy family. Well, actually, it was a much smaller happy family at the time because there were only a handful of us working on it. Uh, that was probably what they're talking about, that I was doing my best to get everybody on the same team so that all of our stories didn't contradict. Wow, you can see why I write 900-page novels. I can't give a two-sentence answer to a question. Oh no, we love we love these answers. Yeah. We, we like we like hearing yeah, the story because awesome. every every one of them basically referred to you as the one that really got them going and made it cohesive. And you know, back then, of course, it was really early in the game. And I can just imagine what Leland G's job and the editor's job are right now to try to keep everything cohesive with what the hundred and what, 110, 120 Star Wars novels there are. Well, yeah, see, that's a one, lot. That's one, of the, that's one of the things that a lot of fans keep asking me about if if I'm ever going to write another Star Wars book and. You know, I, I did 54 projects for Lucasfilm. If he had my novels and the Young Jedi Knights books and the comics and the pop-up books and, and everything else, I have 54 projects. And I love working for Star Wars, and I still love Star Wars, but I've been writing Dune novels and my saga of Seven Sons and Captain Nemo and Clockwork uh, Angels with Rush and Dan Shamble's MPI and all kinds of other things. So if I would jump back into writing a Star Wars book right now, I'm afraid that the homework would take me 10 years to do just to keep catch up on everything. So uh, it's a little intimidating unless I can find something that is off in its own little desert island someplace. Well, we had uh, Alan Dean Foster on not that long ago, a couple weeks ago, and you know he started with Splinter of the Mind's Eye, right. and then he came back for the approaching storm in 2002. Just imagine how hard it was for him to go from Splinter to... <laughs> Modern Star Wars. Yeah, and, and there's so much stuff now. I mean, when I was writing mine, all I had to do was read Tim Zahn's books and the Dark Empire comics and, and keep in touch with everything that was going on. But now I just don't know how you could – I don't know how you could do it the way that I did it because I made sure that I referenced every other existing Star Wars thing in my books. I don't see how you could do that now. I don't even know how you can you can read them all. Yeah, it, it, it's hard. We Sometimes you have to pick and choose nowadays. Okay, so there's three of us here. We all have different questions. Um, so I guess we're going to go to Travis here, who's on the phone. Um, he has a Star Wars-related question. So, Travis, why don't you ask one of your uh, one of your questions? Sure, Kevin. Nice to talk to you. Thanks, Travis. Um, I have a page, and we uh, polled the audience, and I have some questions from them. Um, we've got a lot of rabid readers on the page. Pat wants to know about the Tales books. Uh, what was it like giving more life to mainly background characters, and how much creative freedom did you have when uh, writing about them? Well, that was – there's an interesting story in the background of that because when we were starting to draw the novels, somebody at Lucasfilm and, and Bantam Books had the idea of doing an anthology of Star Wars short stories, and I was – up at Skywalker Ranch, just I was working on the, the art book with Ralph McCory at the time, so I was in the offices looking at some artwork. And the, the Bantam publisher and the Lucasfilm licensing person were discussing uh, a Star Wars anthology, but they, they realized that if they had a bunch of other writers doing Star Wars short stories featuring Luke Skywalker and Han Solo and, and all the main characters, 
that would rapidly mess up the continuity that they had. And they decided they weren't going to do the anthology because it would just be too much work. But I was on the other side of the room, and I said, well, why don't we do a peripheral anthology? Why don't we do something that just tells all the stories of the, the people in the cantina scene? What's the story about uh, the band, and why does the bartender hate droids, and who is the guy with the death sentence on 12 systems and all that? And they loved that idea. That, that It would be a great way to do stories in the Star Wars universe, a scene that everybody loved, and it gives you all the background, but it wouldn't really interfere with with the continuity. And there was some background of these guys um, from West End Games. They had done some gaming supplement books, and they did little background information about uh, the band and, and Loma and Nadon, and the, the Ithorian, and the uh, bartender, and the various other people. So we used that as a starting point, but everybody got to tell their own stories, and to me, that was, going back to your other question, that was kind of the start of me herding the cats of all the other writers to make sure that everybody read everybody else's story, make sure that their stuff didn't contradict, and I even encouraged them to to interlink their stories so that it was really like a bunch of people who, who got together rather than just random stories. Um, I personally, I can say, I definitely love those stories. Like reading from Tales from Jabba's Palace, I remember I really got emotionally involved in uh, the one about the Rancor Keeper. Yeah. You know, because like, then you watch the movie, like, oh my goodness, I feel so bad for the Rancor. It just died. <laughs> That's like, I did that one, and I wrote it when I was out in Death Valley in the desert where they filmed those scenes. So it was kind of neat, neat connection to that. But I, that was one of the things that struck me most about Return of the Jedi, where just that little scene at the end when the Rancor gets killed and then we see the the shocked and grief-stricken face of the Rancor Keeper as he stumbles in to see the dead monster. And I just, that got me all choked up and I thought, wow, what a story that must be. I'm glad I got the chance to tell it. And uh, you've got to tell lots of other stories. Because like, you said you started off by doing the Jedi Academy trilogy. And uh, then you got to go back and do the background for your trilogy by doing the, the Tales of the Jedi, Tales of the Sith comics about Exar Kun, Ulek, uh, Keldroma, Nami Sunrider, and so on. So what was it like to go back and do a comic to tell the backstory of these characters which you had created? Well, because I worked so hard to make Dark Empire connect with, with my Jedi Academy trilogy, I got to know Tom Veach uh, very well. And... He was starting the Tales of the Jedi. He created the Tales of the Jedi because he did a, a series before ours. And as he was plotting Tales of the Jedi, I was plotting the Jedi Academy books. And he was doing a series that was set 4,000 years before the movies. And I had this character of Exar Kun, who was the spirit of a long dead Dark Lord of the Sith coming back to cause trouble. So we thought, hey, what if my long dead Dark Lord of the Sith was around at the time of his Tales of the Jedi comics, and we told that origin story that tied them together. So, again, it's like a macrame thing. I'm going back and tying knots of other strings. And, uh, and I hadn't re written comics before, although I read a lot of them. So Tom Beach kind of took me as, as his Padawan and taught me how to be a comic writer. So we did, uh, we plotted out the whole Dark Lords of the Sith and then the Sith War. That was 12 issues. And then I did another 12-issue thing with uh, even a thousand years further back from that uh, called The Golden Age of the Sith and The Fall of the Sith Empire. And I just had a blast with those because it was so far removed from the other movies that you didn't have to worry about the exact details and historical stuff. It was more of a King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table version of Jedi Knights rather than the, the film version. And I can definitely say as a as a young adult, um, those comics with the Dave Dorman covers were just fantastic. Like the art and everything just everything involved in it are some of my favorite and like Nami Sunrider and, and X R Kun, they're just well they're they're classic Sith now. They're they're mainstay characters in Star Wars are like Thrawn with, with Zahn and everyone knows who they are. And uh, you were able to bring them to life with your comic in ways that are you know, everyone remembers. Yeah, those well, comics are pretty BA. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I wish that uh, I could go back and write novels in that time period, but it's been kind of muddied with uh, the Old Republic games and, and other things in that time period that don't quite match up with the comics, so I don't, 
I don't quite know how you'd resolve all of that, but... I bet Leland Chi could still find a way to make it work, even if you have to bend backwards, twist three times, and do a back somersault. Well, that might be worth watching. <laughs> yeah, <really. laughs> I'd like to see Leland Chi do that. <laughs> so, Travis, do you have a, another question for him? Yeah. Um, Mo wants to know, what was your inspiration for the mall installation? Or, sorry, what was your inspiration for the mall installation? Uh, the mall installation... When I was asked to write the Jedi Academy books, I was working as a technical writer for the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, which is a big government nuclear weapons design lab in California. So I was I was in a government weapons design lab, and I thought, wouldn't it be cool if we had an imperial design lab? Because somebody had to design the Death Star and the laser and whatever other weapons they had. Um, so the MAW installation is sort of my my take on the, the Livermore lab in space. Nice. That's really cool. That's so uh, I guess on the... On oh, sorry. Kat, do you have something to say? Oh, yeah. I was just going to say because, like, you know, I'm familiar with a couple of those things like Lawrence Livermore and, you know, Los Alamos National Labs. That, like, connection, that's actually really cool. Now I'm not going to be able to look at them all the same way. Well, there's even some my own little snide stuff that I got in there because, again, I was working for the government. I was there for, like, 14 years. I had a security clearance. And I remember we received this big, fat document in a binder. Like a, it was called an emergency response plan that if this giant earthquake struck and all the buildings collapsed, we were supposed to refer to this response plan to figure out how to evacuate. And I thought that was kind of ridiculous because I was just going to haul ass and run like hell if the buildings were collapsing. <laughs> um, but there, it, there's a little scene in, um, I think, Champions of the Force when the Maw installation is being attacked and overrun by, by the New Republic forces that the head of the installation is over the intercom yelling for everybody, you know, this, things are exploding all over the place. They're under attack. The whole place is falling. And he's on the intercom telling everyone to refer to their emergency response plan to know what to do. So that, that ties in with my real activities in Livermore Lab. And so a little bit about the Ma then. Um, the Ma is where you introduced Admiral Dalla, who is one of the strongest female characters in the Star Wars universe. So with Admiral Dalla, there's been lots of discussion from our members about, um, you know, some of them say how she's an incredibly strong character, and some of them say how the the background that she basically slept her way to the top um, sort of undoes that. So what was your inspiration for Dala, and how do you see her as a character? Like, what, what's her personality, and is she as strong as she appears in most of the most of the novels? Well, obviously, I think that she's strong, but what she was... The, uh, there was a lot of comments when I was publishing them that, that she wasn't as great of a tactical genius as Grand Admiral Thrawn was, and I went, well, duh, that's, that's not the point. Um, she was much more of a a ruthless, vicious, reactionary person who is um, basically shoots first and thinks later. But I didn't. I thought that she was very talented and very skilled, and she got promoted. She didn't sleep her way to the top. She attract. She was attracted to people who were as skilled and as powerful as she was, or as she wanted to be. So she wasn't just taking the shortcut she was she was drawn to the people that had the powers and the influence that she wanted so i think she's proved herself since then as being a especially in dark saber that she's proved to be a a pretty tough leader and but she's not a a cool intellectual tactical genius she's much more of a um uh, how do i see it almost some parts of it, she's almost like a mad dog, where she's just going wild and attacking the people that she really, really hates. Um, but she got a little bit calmer as she went on and a little bit more ruthless. And I'm glad that she was... I wanted to kill her off at the end of book two, but nobody would let me, so she escaped at, at the end of uh, Dark Apprentice. Sorry for the spoiler, guys, but it's been 20 years. Um, so that really she was she was intended to blow up and die at the end of the climax of Dark Imp uh, Dark Apprentice, but um, my test readers locked me in a closet until I promised I would rewrite it. So good and good thing it did because in Dark Saber it was basically her crowning 
Yeah, there's there's a scene in Dark Saber which is basically her crowning achievement in my book when she has all the the moths in in the the ship with her, telling him what's what, and they don't agree with her, and so she just you know puts on the gas mask and they all die. Yep. Also, spoiler guys, it's been what 18 years for that one. So. Something like that. <laughs> And that that's definitely, you know, a huge achievement. And then of course since she disappears and she came back recently in the Star Wars novels, um have you are you familiar with what they were able to do with her in the Fate of the Jedi series and are you satisfied with what they did? Uh, I'm I'm only very, very vaguely uh got comments from what other fans have told me because I'm I haven't read the following books, so I'll just put that out there right now, just because I've got again, I've I've published about six books a year and I got big Dune books and Seven Sons books I'm doing, so I don't even read anymore. I just read my own stuff when I'm proofreading it. But I, I, I do have to emphasize, though, and people ask me this a lot when, like, Kip Duran comes back and other writers do things to him, or um, Jason and Jaina, who are characters we spend a lot of time with developing, and they go, well, how could you let them do that to your characters? Guys, they're not my characters. They're Lucasfilm's characters. They're toys that they let me play with, and I have to put them back in the sandbox when I'm done. So it, it's not up to me to decide whether I'm satisfied with it or not. That's, they're just uh, they're characters that I created while I worked for Lucasfilm, and I'm very, very pleased to have had the chance to uh, contribute to the universe. Excellent. Okay, so Travis, do you have another question? Yeah, that was actually one of my points. Tyler wanted me to give you praise for the concepts that you developed that were used by other authors. Thank you. Do you have any advice for up-and-coming authors or comic book artists to get into the industry? Well, comic book artists I don't have any connection with because I, I didn't work on that side of the industry. Um, you just have to understand that it's going to be hard and it's going to be a lot of work and that nobody ever said it was supposed to be easy. Um, think about being a best-selling writer is very equivalent to, say, making the Olympic team, uh, the Olympic ice skating team or, or wrestling team or whatever you want. Um, you don't just decide one morning, oh, I'm going to be an Olympic ice skater. Why don't they let me on the team? It's something that you spend years and years and years honing your skills, practicing, working out, sweating, getting injured, getting, getting healed working your way up from smaller competitions to bigger competitions. And even if you spend your entire life doing that, you still might not make the Olympic team. Um, being a writer is very much the same thing. You have to write and keep writing and keep practicing and improving your craft and making connections and submitting and getting rejected and submitting again. And you still might not make it or you might make it, but it's not a quick easy shortcut. I don't really know any writers that just wrote a story and suddenly were an overnight success. Right. Okay, so I guess one more question about Star Wars from me, and then we're going to work into other books which you've run, done, because you've done a lot of books, which a lot of us have read. Good. So I guess the, the last Star Wars question from my part All right. would be, you got to write 14 Young Jedi Knight books with your wife. What was it like writing Star Wars with your wife and writing 14 books over what, a three or four year period? that introduced lots and lots of characters and for me were just a lot of fun to read. Well, we and we also outlined and, and developed the whole Junior Jedi Knight thing that uh, Nancy Richardson wrote, wrote the first three of those books and Rebecca wrote the other three. So in those books, we basically developed the character of Anakin and, and introduced Tahiri, who I, I've heard as stars in a bunch of the other books now too. Um, I had done a lot of work for Lucasfilm and I would go up to Skywalker Ranch at least once a month just to meet with them on various projects. And they had, some of your listeners might know this or remember them, but there was a kids' book series of Star Wars books called The Glove of Darth Vader and the Zorba the Hutt's Revenge. Yes, with, the, with Triculus and uh, so on. Yeah. That makes no sense now. Uh, beautiful, Zorba. Yeah, beautiful Drew Strews and covers, but they... They, they didn't really do all that well, and they didn't really capture the magic of what Star Wars was. And I remember Lucas, somebody at Lucasfilm asking me that, Kevin, do you think there's a young adult audience for Luca, for Star Wars? Because the, the books hadn't performed as well as they wanted. And I said, well, yeah, of course there's a young adult audience for Star Wars. And I'm thinking, have you, have you seen Star Wars? Of course there's a young <laughs> audience for Star Wars. 
Um, but the problem was that the those books, the Glove of Darth Vader and stuff, didn't really have any kids as main characters. They had kind of Luke Skywalker acting like a kid. And I thought to do a young adult series, you wanted to actually have teenage characters. Now, we could have done like a young Luke Skywalker or young Princess Leia or something. They didn't want to interfere with the, the pre-New Hope timeline because nobody knew what George was going to do with the prequel trilogy. So we suggested, uh, well, I suggested writing them with my wife, who is the young adult writer, uh, and they agreed and they signed us up to do three. And as soon as we turned in the first one, they read it and said, hey, this is good, do six instead. And after six, they said do 11, and after 11, they said do 14. So um, those books came out every three months, 14 books times every three months. So it was um, quite a busy time. We were doing book signings for one as we were doing proofreading of the typeset of the next one as we were doing the final draft of the one after that as we were doing the uh, plotting for the one after that. And it was kind of hard to keep track of all the storylines and where they were. But um, Rebecca and I have done about 35 books together now, and and we've been married 21 years. So I suppose we managed to work out the, the collaborative process. So basically for four years, you and your wife lived, breathed, and spoke Star Wars all the time. Well, probably even more than that because I did all these other projects too. But hey, if you got to commute and go to a job someplace, you might as well do it in a galaxy far, far away. Amen to that. That's true. 20, okay, so it's like twenty-five hours, eight days a week, time frames that don't even exist. That's how much Star Wars. That's it. Yeah, go he's on. working at McDonald's. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Which would you rather be doing, flipping burgers or flipping pages? <laughs> okay, James. So let's go. Let's go to you, James. Um, you have some questions which you've been waiting in the wings to ask. Ah, uh, indeed. And why I've been waiting in the wings is because while well, I know that Jeremiah and Travis here have Star Wars covered, I like to go just a little bit of a different direction here. Right. And so my question is, one of my questions is this, and I was actually curious. It's more of a personal thing for me. But what inspired you to try your hand at writing the three X-Files books that you did? And did you find them different than, like, say, writing, say, Star Wars or Dune or more of that, you know, fantasy-oriented type of writing? Man, when you talk about personal questions, I thought it was going to be boxers or briefs or something like that. Um, well, you feel free to answer that as well. <laughs> Sweatpants, commando. That's probably more comfortable. That's what my. All right. Um, let's see. Quickly, send it to Lucasfilm. We need official. We need to make this official now. Okay. Free ball. Uh, the the irony is that I got the X Files job because Chris Carter, the creator of uh, X Files, had read my Star Wars books and loved the way I captured the the feel of Star Wars, and he wanted the same thing for the X Files. So I got a call kind of out of the blue saying, Kevin, do you like the X-Files? Would you like to write three books for us? Um, and I did watch the show on TV. I, I enjoyed it, but I wasn't an, an obsessive fan. I just watched it so I knew what was going on. Um, but they flew me down to, to Hollywood. They gave me um, big boxes of, at the time, this is funny, but they gave me big boxes of, of VHS tapes with all of their episodes on them. Some of them hadn't even got the special effects on it yet. So I'll, I remember one where Mulder is, there's like a fire starter guy and he's fighting with, uh, in his house that's burning down and they, the screen suddenly goes blank and it says insert fire special effect here and, and you go on. But um, <laughs> now I, I've always written a lot of different things. My, my first novel, Resurrection Inc., was nominated for the Bram Stoker Award for the best horror novel. So I've got a lot of horror background and fantasy background, and most of my stuff now is pretty much well known as hard science fiction. <laughs> but um, X Files, I thought was cool, and it was a good gig. And and I had always enjoyed the old show, The Night Stalker. So I, I thought it was kind of a neat uh, thing that I could do. And especially when the X Files people told me that what they wanted in a novel was they wanted me to basically write an episode that was way too expensive for them to ever film. Because in a book, I had an unlimited special effects budget. And I thought that was, that was kind of a cool idea. So I, I wrote the first one called Ground Zero, which was about 
atomic bomb ghosts going to kill nuclear weapons researchers. And yeah. those who have been listening will get the connection to Lawrence Livermore Lab yet again. I'm loving um, that. And they liked the Ground Zero one so much, they, they asked me to do two other ones. And there was Ruins, which was about uh, alien spaceships beneath Mayan temple ruins in the Yucatan, which required me and Rebecca to go down to... Uh, to Cancun and stuff to do research while I was doing the, the writing. Uh, and then the third one was called Antibodies, about a, a nanotechnology and a medical experiment gone wrong that creates a monster. So I I had fun doing those a lot, and um, they sold really well. They hit the bestseller list as well, and, and, and I just had a different set of toys to play with. Awesome. Awesome. So I, I, I take it um, the fact that you were really famous as a sci-fi writer was one reason why Blizzard approached you to write a StarCraft novel. The one question I have is why did you write it under a pen name rather than your already well-established name in writing? Well, the, the, there was people at Blizzard – I'm trying to remember how that one came about. Um, I think it was the editor at Pocket Books who had worked with me and they got – they got the StarCraft license and they needed somebody to write a book and asked if I would be be interested. The, the irony there, and, and maybe I'm, I'm crushing some illusions here, but I didn't even play the StarCraft game. They just gave me all the background to it. And uh, Rebecca's brother is a huge StarCraft fan, so he was almost like our private consultant on it as, as we were developing it. Um, at the time the StarCraft thing came out, though, I was publishing so many different books, that not just the, the Star Wars books and the X-Files books, but my own solo books. And there were so many things out there that we felt that I didn't want to put my name on too many things all at once because then it would look like I was overwhelming it. So we used um, Cam Antilles as – no, that was Gabriel Mesta, sorry. Um, Gabriel Mesta, Mesta is my wife's maiden name. That's what she writes under um, we used that as a pen name because I thought I wanted to start another name just so I could keep writing as much as possible. But as you'll see, I decided not to keep that up. We went back to publishing everything under my own name afterward. Oh, of course. I, I actually like those books. I, I, I'm a big StarCraft fan, so getting the background information in between one and two was, was a lot of fun. Okay, so it's good. Travis, do you have any more questions? Uh, yeah. Let's turn to some horror on your your projects uh, working with zombies? Yes. Uh, are you still releasing the three uh, books, Death Warmed Over, Unnatural Acts, and Hair Raising, or are those out already? Um, let's see. That's, that's a humorous horror series that I started out. It, it's really – I just love it to pieces. It's about – uh, Dan Shamble Zombie PI. So it's it's not it's not The Walking Dead. It's sort of uh, a lot funnier than that. Um, it's set in a time when when because of a magical event that happens, all of the monsters, vampires, werewolves, mummies, ghosts, everything come back to the world, and they have to live in uh, a part of the city called the Unnatural Quarter. And our guy is a, a private detective who put out his shingle to work on solving cases for them. His name is Dan Dan Shamble, and he get, he gets killed before the first book starts. But the cases don't solve themselves, so he's back from the dead and back on the case. And he and his uh, human lawyer partner are solving cases about like there's a, a mummy who's suing the you know, suing the museum because. He wants to be emancipated since he's a person, he's not property. And there are two witches, they're sisters, and one of them got transformed into a big fat sow when a spell went terribly wrong, and they're suing the publisher for the misprint uh, in the spell book because they should have run a spell check before publishing it. And there's a, um, let's see, there's a company called the Jekyll Lifestyle Products and Necroceuticals, and they make detergents and toothpaste and deodorants and lip gloss for monsters and one of their batches of shampoo specifically for vampires got contaminated with garlic oil so all the vampires hair fell out so they're they're in trouble for um, for not doing quality control and of course Dan Shamble's trying to solve his own murder about who 
who killed him, and he's solving all these different cases. So Death Warmed Over came out last September. Unnatural Acts is the second one that came out in, in January, and the third one, Hair Raising, will come out in May. So they're, they're very quick reads, very fun, and that's why they're coming out so close together. And uh, it looks like I'm about to sign up to do book four in the series. So uh, if you get a chance, check them out. I really, I really have fun with those. I, I laugh out loud myself when I'm writing them, although you're not supposed to laugh at your own jokes. Um, but they're, they're fun and, and fast paced and I really get a kick out of them. So let's do our best to make the series take off. I really hope anybody who likes um, say Jim Butcher or Charlene Harris and uh, that kind of stuff will probably enjoy these. Yeah, that just sounds like a lot of fun. I'm definitely going to check them out and feature them on my page for my fans. Oh, thank you. Well, that's, you know, that's actually pretty awesome, to tell you the truth. That sounds like something I definitely want to read. Uh, but moving along a little bit here, you know, changing it up like I always try to do. Um, I got another question for you. Um, I know that um, at our uh, forum, you know, that, uh, you know, we're kind of have our uh, our message board and whatnot. Uh, hosting us at um, our founder, General Keel. He's you know a huge music file. He's all in everything, so I know he'll be interested in this one. But um, I actually wanted to ask you what it was like working on Clockwork Angels with uh, Neil Pert, and like how exactly did that pairing happen? Well, my my first novel, Resurrection Inc., from 1988, uh, in the dedication page, I put in there that it was inspired by the Rush album, Grace Under Pressure, because every song on Grace Under Pressure is part of the, the novel, Resurrection Inc. And I just put that in the acknowledgments, and I signed copies and mailed them off to Mercury Records. That was the label that, that the Rush album was on. And I got a letter back from Neil Peer, who's the drummer from Rush and the guy who writes all their lyrics. And that was like 1989 or 1990 or something. And we've been good friends and corresponding ever since. We've met over and over again. I've been backstage at every concert since like 1991 or something like that. Lucky. Um, and we, Neil and I wrote a short story together called Drum Beats. Which you can you can download it as an ebook. It's up there now. It's a solo. Um, Drum beats is kind of a creepy dark fantasy story about a a rock drummer bicycling through Africa, which is what Neil actually did for fun at the time. And he comes upon a village, a very creepy village, where they make special drums that are covered with human skin. So it's kind of a creepy little story about what he runs into. And and we did that story together and published it back in the 90s, and like I said, it's up, up now as, as an e-story if you want to read it. But we've always wanted to do something bigger and better together. He, he wrote the introduction to one of my short story collections, and um, so many Rush songs have inter influenced many, many of my other stories. Uh, so in this case, Neil was developing the story of their new album called Clockwork Angels, and it's a big concept album, kind of like Pink Floyd's The Wall or Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band or these things that have a whole story all the way through. And he was brainstorming with me about the story and the characters and and quickly decided he wanted to be a, a wanted it to be a full story and that we should work on the novel and I should write it. So I'm not gonna turn that down. I thought it was a terrific thing and got um the the lyrics as he wrote them song after song and I got to hear the rough cuts of the of the tracks as, as Rush recorded them and put them together into the the book version of Clockwork Angels and it, it, if you haven't seen it, if you can find it in a bookstore, just pick it up. It's one of the most beautiful books that I've ever had published. It's got full color throughout. It's got brand new paintings by Hugh Sign, the guy who's done all the Rush album covers and it's just, it's a gorgeous, snazzy book, and it's kind of a steampunk fantasy adventure. Um, you don't have to like Rush to enjoy it, but I think you'll catch a lot of Rush Easter eggs in the, in the prose if you read it. But um, it was, it was a real kick. I, I think I got a little street cred from doing that, but we certainly had fun with it. Neil, Neil's very proud of the project, and um, it's just something new. I don't like to do the same thing all the time. I like different stuff. 
and that that's a great one. I know our fans personally, if we even mention the name Neil Peart or in, in association with a the podcast, they probably wet themselves and go screaming oh, yeah. because we love our rock. We love our metal and names like Neil Peart just put people in comas. Okay, hey, well, what can I, I got to tell you that it's Neil Peart, not Peart. You got to pronounce it with the long E sound. Peart, sorry. Well, Neil now we know. I've that been mispronouncing that my whole life. It's all rush all the time. Oh, all dude, right. I mean, come on. When we started this podcast, we were going by our uh, nicknames from the forum. He's got Bane Nathos. Uh, mine was Kent Limelight. Limelight came from where do you think? Of course. <laughs> There's lots of connections okay. for many years between between Rush's songs and, and my fiction. And if you – in fact, there's even one of the – in one of the Dune books, there's a quote, there's a Mentat philosopher that's named Peart N instead of Neil Peart. So, that's, and in fact, I think the line that the philosopher uses is, if you choose not to decide, you will have made it, you still have made a choice. So, Rush <laughs> guys will get that, other people might not notice, but. Okay, so that's a, that's a good transition since, you know, the two main authors you worked with is, well, your wife and then Brian Herbert. And, of course, with that, you've, for the most part, other than um, I know I've been reading your, your Hellhole series recently, but you've been working on Dune with him. So how did your relationship with Brian Herbert start, and how did you begin writing Dune books? Because um, you've done a ton of Dune books uh, after, of course, Frank Herbert died. Well, Dune, I was always a huge Dune fan. Dune's my favorite science fiction novel of all time. I think it's the best science fiction novel ever written. I've read it a dozen times myself. And Frank wrote six books in, in the series, that and those books span like 6,000 years of time. It's a big, big universe that he created. But with his last book called Chapter House Dune, it's in the middle of a story, and it ends on a cliffhanger, and then Frank Herbert passed away. So as a Dune fan, it was pretty clear to me that there was more to the story, and I wanted to know how it ended. And uh, after all of my work with Star Wars and with the X-Files and, and my original science fiction books, which um, I got some award nominations and Nebula Award nominations and, and some other stuff. So with the track record of being able to write in somebody else's universe and with kind of the respectability I've gotten with my own writing, I, I approached Brian Herbert and asked if he intended to finish the series because the last the last novel Frank Herbert published was a collaboration with Brian, so they had been working together uh, anyway. And Brian was established as a science fiction writer in his own right. Uh, but it had been, I don't know, nine or ten years since Frank Herbert passed away, and there was no Dune books forthcoming. So I wanted to know if there was anything in the works or if there were any notes left behind or, or what was going on, because I, I was a fan. I wanted to know how the story ended. and. We really hit it off together when we got in touch, and we're both huge Dune fans and huge Frank Herbert fans, and uh, we we decided we might want to uh, try to put two sets of feet into Frank Herbert's shoes and see what we could do. And we we dug around, and we eventually discovered some notes that Frank Herbert had left behind his outline for how he wanted the story to end, plus all kinds of background material of the the prior history and uh, things that he had developed when he built the universe. And so Brian and I have done a bunch of different trilogies. We've done the, the prequel trilogy to Dune, which is the love story of Duke Leto and Lady Jessica and their first battles with Baron Harkonnen. Uh, those are the, the house books, House Atreides, House Harkonnen, and House Carino. And then we went way back in time, 10,000 years before Dune, to tell the whole story about the Butlerian Jihad, the big war against the thinking machines and the discovery of the planet Dune and Spice and the sandworms and all that. Um, and then we finally had all the, all the seeds planted so that we could go and tell the grand finale of the story, which were Hunters of Dune and Sandworms of Dune. And right now, what we're, we're in the middle of is another trilogy that the first one is called Sisterhood of Dune, came out last year, and it's just out in paperback now. And I'm just finishing up the fifth edit on second book called Mentats of Dune. Those are those are stories way back during the Butler and Jihad time frame or right after that, showing the formation of the Bene Gesserit Sisterhood, the Spacing Guild and the Navigators, the Mentats, mm -hmm. all that stuff, which none of which means anything if you haven't read Dune, but I hope at least 
Star Wars fans have checked out Dune because there's some good stuff. And and after those dozen or so books that we did together, and, and Dune books are not quick little stories. They're things that take a long time and are very complicated. We figured out how to write books together, and so we developed our own universe called Hellhole, which is that's what we're in the middle of now, and Hellhole Awakening, the second book, comes out at the end of March, so I'll be going on a national book signing tour for that, and we hope Star Wars fans and Dune fans and my Saga of Seven Sons fans uh, will pick those up and come out and see me at my signings. I'm in, let's see, San Diego, Dallas, Houston, Seattle, Atlanta, Dayton, and Richmond, Virginia, so come on out and see me there. The, the details are on my my website schedule called uh, wordfire.com. I'm dumping away too much information. Sorry about that. Maybe. Oh, that's fine. We we love it. We love it. Yeah, we can disseminate it later. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So, um. So I have a question, which I just saw on my list here. That this person's asked me at least ten times to ask you. So it might seem silly, but they really really want to know. They want to know since you they they refer to you as one of the foremost experts on Dune, which Dune adaptation they should. Um, like or watch more, which is closer, the the 1984 film um, or the sci-fi adaptation in 2004? Well, neither one gets it exactly right, so let's hope we get to remake it and do it like Peter Jackson did for Lord of the Rings. I think that would really, really do a good job. But the David, the David Lynch movie from 1984 uh, doesn't follow the plot as well as I would like. There are some key things from Dune that they – that they miss. For example, at, at the very end of the movie, the Paul calls rain down, so it starts raining in the desert, which looks great as a movie, but they've established throughout the whole series that the rain kills sandworms, so they would all be dying, and that kind of doesn't sound right. But it looks good. I mean, the, the big spectacle, the ships, the costumes, the sets, everything really captures the, the grandeur of Dune. Uh, on the other hand, though, the, the Sci-Fi Channel miniseries had more room to work with. That was six hours long. They had a chance to be able to fill more of the details of the story, uh, and they follow it a lot better, but but their budget was smaller, so the, the sets and the special effects and everything aren't, aren't as spectacular as the David Lynch one. So the answer would be to watch them, watch them both and, and take the good parts from each one, but your best bet is to go back and read the original books. I guess the advantage of the sci-fi one is they also got to do um, Messiah of Dune and Children of Dune in the sequel series, so yeah, at least you get more of the story overall than you do with the, the David Lynch one. Yeah, I mean, I don't really think it's an, it's an either-or thing. I mean, that you can watch them both. I love the Toto soundtrack on the David Lynch movie, and I I just love some of those great scenes in it, but, um, but again, it, it doesn't exactly follow the Frank Herbert book, but but it's a terrific book. It's it's hard to adapt the whole thing into a movie. Let's um, there there is nothing in the works right now. But let's hope that it it eventually gets made into a another series. That is true. Okay, so we're going to begin wrapping this up. We're going to give each of us um, one more question. So we're going to go with uh, James. Do you have one more question you can ask? Oh, indeed I do. Completely going off the rails yet again. That's <laughs> what I do. Um. Let's see here. Okay. For my last question, I'd like to ask this. I was wondering exactly how you ended up writing the whole JSA Strange Adventures for DC Comics, and, like, how exactly did that differ from, say, writing, you know, the novels and short stories that, you know, you're mostly known for? Well, I, I have done a fair number of comics, but what was kind of a, a convoluted, story, the president of DC Comics is a big fan of my Dune books, and I would always send him Dune books, and I'd get stacks of free comics all the time, and I also wrote two novels. One was The Last Days of Krypton, and one was Enemies and Allies, so that they're like Superman universe novels, Batman novels, um, and they wanted to know if I wanted to write comics, too, and they asked what I'd be interested in, and I really really adore the superheroes set in like the 40s. To me, that has sort of the right nostalgic feel to it when you can run around in costumes with superpowers, and it's it's just not quite the same when they set it in the modern day to me. 
So I suggested this whole interesting combination of the 1940s version of the Justice Society of America with, with the old classic superheroes. But I tied it together with Amazing Stories magazine, and I, I brought actual Golden Age science fiction writer Jack Williamson, um, who was a famous guy at the time, that he's writing the stories of the superheroes for Amazing Stories magazine. And Jack Williamson himself, who has since passed away, but he's like 93 at the time, was very thrilled to be himself starring in the comics that he used to read when he was a young man. And we wrote that together, and I just I thought it was a really cool, nostalgic story. It's been collected as a graphic novel. Um, but again, uh, writing comics and writing superhero comics are different from writing just a regular graphic novel with a set storyline, kind of like the Tales of the Jedi stuff. Um, I, I just do lots of different things. I mean, I've said it several times. I, I must have ADD or something. I switch from one project to the next. It's like a writing awesome. renaissance, man. <laughs> You're able to focus on lots of things. I drink a lot of coffee. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. And yeah, I bet you don't sleep much. Today's Kevin James Anderson novel brought to you by coffee. Yes. <laughs> okay, so Travis, ask your last question, and then we'll wrap up with Mike. Yeah, we'll stay on DC. Um, I'm a huge Batman fan myself. Um, Enemies and Allies, the first meeting of Batman and Superman, was that all your idea, or where did you pull from for that? Well, I had, the previous book I did was The Last Days of Krypton, and that was the one that I, I first pitched to DC, because I write these big epic science fiction stories, and I thought that the, the end of Superman's planet was kind of like the last days of Pompeii. And I wanted to write a big science fiction epic that talked about Jor-El discovering the Phantom Zone and General Zod taking over the planet and Brainiac stealing the city of Kandor and shrinking it down and putting it under a, a glass dome and, and Argo City and Jor-El's smarter brother Zor-El, how they escaped and they're the parents of Supergirl and I just thought that would make a terrific, big, epic novel, and I, I pitched that to, to DC Comics, and they loved the idea for the novel. So as I, I wrote that one, and it, it came out, and I think they've just, they both just been reissued. As I was finishing up, that was just a one-time thing. Then the guy from DC said, so what are we doing next? What's our next one? Because he loved it so much, and um, we just brainstormed back and forth, and they wanted me to do a, a Superman and Batman novel, but I, I didn't just want to do a Superman and Batman have an adventure kind of story. I, I wanted something um, unique, and I thought setting it back in the 50s during the Cold War was a cool idea, and making it the first meeting just gave it something special. And I just loved researching all of the uh, the history of, of the 1950s, the, the Joseph McCarthy era, the Sputnik stuff, the, the Cold War against the Soviets. And, of course, you got Lois Lane, who is not really going to be a leave it to beaver type of mom in the 1950s. She's, she's a tough lady and is going to fight for what she wants to do. So that added some interesting stuff. And uh, it just let me really understand who Clark Kent and who Bruce Wayne were. And, and I had a, a really good – realization when I was writing it that I, I thought that even though he's Superman, what Kal-El would really rather be is he'd really rather be Clark Kent because he just wants to be this. Well, I was what I was saying is that I think Bruce Wayne really wants to be Batman. That's his, that, that's his true identity and his disguise is as Bruce Wayne, whereas for Superman, it's the other way around. Sorry, long and esoteric answer as usual. So that's fine. Jeremiah, your turn. Last question. Okay, so there's a lot I, you know, there's so much I could ask you, you know, because I ask about Captain Nemo, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, it's a Saga Seven Sons, Right of the Future, but I guess what I'm going to ask is, uh, we come from a community of writers. A lot of people like to write, especially they write um, in the universe of Star Wars, and what tips or um, I guess uh, inspiration would you give to people that want to write Star Wars, want to write it for fun, not necessarily sell it, but like to just help them become better writers in that universe and be proud of their work? Well, I mean, one of the things to become a better writer is you have to 
Right. I mean, you have to keep writing, keep practicing. I'll, I'll go back to the metaphor of trying to make the Olympic team. I mean, you, you, you have to condition yourself every day. You have to work out every day. You have to get, get yourself better and better. Um, on, on my blog, which is my initials, kjablog.com, I often will post, like, writing posts and, and some advice to things. So that might be something you want to check out. Um, but really, the way you get to be a better writer is you read a lot of things and you write a lot of things, and you have to be persistent. As, as I said before, there's no such thing as an overnight success. You just keep keep trying, and if you're just doing Star Wars for fun, obviously the person you have to please is yourself. Uh, if you're trying to become a professional writer publishing your own original books, uh, then obviously you've got to submit them to publishers and, and get through the gauntlet of editors and get chosen among thousands of other submissions. And uh, it's not an easy process, but some of us broke through, so it's possible. Awesome. Thank you. So uh, thank you for being on the show. This has been excellent. I know our fans are going to be salivating for this, and they're actually going to probably want to beg to have you on in the future and more and more in the future. We'll wait a little bit on that so we don't overwhelm you because we have a tour coming up. <laughs> but I guess in, in wrap-up um, – any plugs you want to make? Anything you want to make? Uh, tell the fans to go promote, go buy, in addition to your, your tour and your book um, signings that are coming up. Anything else you want to plug? Well, sure. Well, if, you are, if you're going to put a link on the, on the site so that you can get the list of my tour schedule, I would, I would love to see people come out for the signings. And it's, it's really, really important because if the publisher flies me to a city and I get to a bookstore and nobody shows up, it doesn't look too good. So please show up for the book signings, and uh, we will always have, well, almost always have a real group, good group of 501sters showing up in, in uniform to, to troop with me. Um, aspiring writers, something else you might want to look into is I run a three-day uh, intensive seminar called the Superstars Writing Seminar, and you can just Google that or put a link on the on the page. That's three days worth of advice taught by five international best-selling writers, including Dave Wolverton and Brandon Sanderson and Rebecca Mesta and, and Eric Flint on how to be a professional writer. So they might want to check into that if they're serious about being writers. And otherwise, just uh, keep reading. And if you get a chance, I really appreciate reading my stuff but you know in addition to the star wars books we talked about hellhole and clockwork angels and the dan shambles zombie pi stuff and whatever i've got plenty of stuff out there i hope you enjoy it